G'day tribe. I just want to share a bit of Aussie, a bit of Henry Lawson, and there's no bad vibes here. This is The Drover's Wife. It's a cool story about a snake in, <laughs> in a house and all sorts of other stuff. There's a dog and a snake. I hope I can get that. A dog and a snake. Um, kids and the drover's wife. Let's roll. Henry Lawson, you rock. The drover's wife. two-roomed house is built of round timber, slabs and stringy bark, and floored with split slabs. A big bark kitchen standing at one end is larger than the house itself, veranda included. Bush all round. Bush with no horizon, for the country is flat. No ranges in the distance. The bush consists of stunted, rotten native apple trees. No undergrowth. Nothing to relieve the eyes save the darker green of a few she-oaks which are sighing above the narrow, almost waterless creek. Nineteen miles to the nearest sign of civilization, a shanty on the main road. The drover, an ex-squatter, is away with his sheep. His wife and children are left here alone. Four ragged, dried-up looking children are playing about the house. Suddenly, one of them yells, Snake! Mother, here's a snake! The gaunt, sun-brown bushwoman dashes from the kitchen, snatches her baby from the ground, holds it on her left hip and reaches for a stick. Where is it? Here, here, gone into the wood heap, yells the eldest boy, a sharp-faced urchin of eleven. Stop there, Mother, I'll have him. Stand back, I'll have the beggar. Tommy, come here, or you'll be bit. Come here at once when I tell you, you little wretch. The youngster comes reluctantly, carrying a stick bigger than himself. Then he yells triumphantly, There it goes, under the house, and darts away with a club uplifted. At the same time, the big, black, yellow-eyed dog of all breeds, who has shown the wildest interest in the proceedings, breaks his chain and rushes after that snake. He's a moment late, however and his nose reaches the crack in the slabs just as the end of its tail disappears. Almost at the same moment, the boy's club comes down and skins the aforesaid nose. Alligator takes the small notice of this and proceeds to undermine the building, but he's subdued after a struggle and chained up again. They cannot afford to lose him. The drover's wife makes the children stand together near the doghouse while she watches for the snake. She gets two small dishes of milk and sets them down near the wall to tempt it to come out. But an hour goes by and it has not shown itself. It is near sunset and a thunderstorm is coming. The children must be brought inside. She will not take them into the house for she knows that the snake is there and may at any moment come up through a crack in the rough slab floor. So she carries several armfuls of firewood into the kitchen and then takes the children there. The kitchen has no floor, or rather an earthen one, called a ground floor in this part of the bush. There is a large, roughly made table in the centre. She brings the children in and makes them sit on the table. They are two boys and two girls, mere babies. She gives them some supper, and then, before it gets dark, she goes into the house and snatches up some pillows and bedclothes, expecting to see or lay her hand on the snake at any minute. She makes a bed on the kitchen table for the children and sits down beside it to watch all night. She has an eye on the corner and a green sapling club laid in readiness on the dresser by her side. Also, her sewing basket and a copy of Young Lady's Journal. She has brought the dog into the room. Tommy turns in under protest, but says he'll lie awake all night and smash that blinded snake. 
His mother asks him how many times she has told him not to swear. He has his club with him under the bedclothes, and Jackie protests, Mummy, Tommy's skinning me alive with his club. Make him take it out. Tommy says, Shut up, you little munger. Do you want to be bit with a snake? Jackie shuts up. If you're bit, says Tommy after a pause, you'll swell up and swell up and turn red and green and blue all over till you burst, won't he, mother? Now then, don't frighten the child. Go to sleep, she says. The two younger children go to sleep, and now and then Jackie complains of being squeezed. More room is made for him. Presently, Tommy says, Mother, listen to them blanky little possums. I'd like to screw their blanky necks. And Jackie protests drowsily. But they don't hurt us, the little blanks. The mother says, There, I told you you'd teach Jackie to swear. But the remark makes her smile. Jackie goes to sleep. Presently, Tommy asks, Mother, do you think they'll ever extricate the blanky kangaroos? Lord, how am I to know, child? Go to sleep. Will you wake me if the snake comes out? Yes, go to sleep. Near midnight, the children are all asleep and she sits there still sewing and reading by turns. From time to time, she glances around the floor and wall plate and whenever she hears a noise, she reaches for the stick. The thunderstorm comes on and the wind rushing through the cracks in the slab wall threatens to blow out her candle. She places it on a sheltered part of the dresser and fixes up a newspaper to protect it. At every flash of lightning, the cracks between the slabs gleam like polished silver. The thunder rolls and the rain comes down in torrents. Alligator lies at full length on the floor with his eyes turned towards the petition. She knows by this that the snake is there. There are large cracks in that wall opening under the floor of the dwelling house. She's not a coward, but recent events have shaken her nerves. A little son of a brother-in-law was lately bitten by a snake and died. Besides, she's not heard from her husband for six months and is anxious about him. She's used to being left alone. She once lived like this for 18 months. As a girl, she built the usual castles in the air, but all her girlish hopes and aspirations have long been dead. She finds all the excitement and recreation she needs in the young lady's journal, and, heaven help her, takes a pleasure in the fashion plates. Her husband is an Australian, and so is she. He is careless, but a good enough husband. If he had the means, he would take her to the city and keep her there like a princess. They are used to being apart, or at least she is. No use fretting, she says. One of her children died while she was here alone. She rode 19 miles for assistance, carrying the dead child. It must be near one or two o'clock. The fire is burning low. Alligator lies with his head resting on his paws and watches the wall. He's not a very beautiful dog to look at, and the light shows numerous old wounds where the hair won't grow. He's afraid of nothing on the face of the earth or under it. He will tackle a bullock as readily as he will tackle a flea. He hates all other dogs, except kangaroo dogs, and has a marked dislike to friends or relations of the family. They seldom call, however. He sometimes makes friends with strangers. He hates snakes and has killed many, but he will be bitten some day and die. Most snake dogs end that way. Now and then the bushwoman lays down her work and watches and listens and thinks. She thinks of things in her own life, for there is little else to think about. The rain will make the grass grow, and this reminds her how she fought a bushfire once while her husband was away. The grass was long and very dry, and the fire threatened to burn her out. 
She put on an old pair of her husband's trousers and beat out the flames with a green bough till great drops of sooty perspiration stood out on her forehead and ran in streaks down her blackened arms. The sight of his mother in trousers greatly amused Tommy, who worked like a little hero by her side. But the terrified baby howled lustily for his mummy. The fire would have mastered her, but for four excited bushmen who arrived in the nick of time. It was a mixed-up affair all round. When she went to take up the baby, he screamed and struggled convulsively, thinking it was a black man. An alligator, trusting more to the baby's sense than his own instinct, charged furiously and, being old and slightly deaf, did not in his excitement at first recognise his mistress's voice but continued to hang on to the moleskins until choked off by Tommy with a saddle strap. The dog's sorrow for his blunder and his anxiety to let it be known that it was all a mistake was as evident as his ragged tail and a 12-inch grin could make it. It was a glorious time for the boys, a day to look back to and talk about and laugh over for many years. She has few pleasures to think of as she sits there alone by the fire, on guard against a snake. All days are much the same to her, but on Sunday afternoon, she dresses herself, tidies the children, smartens up baby, and goes for a lonely walk along the bush track, pushing an old perambulator in front of her. She does this every Sunday. She takes as much care to make herself and the children look smart as she would if she were taking them to do the block in the city. There is nothing to see, however, and not a soul to meet. You might walk for 20 miles along this track without being able to fix a point in your mind, unless you're a bushman. This is because of the everlasting, maddening sameness of the stunted trees, that monotony which makes a man long to break away and travel as far as trains can go, and sail as far as ships can sail, and further. But this bushwoman is used to the loneliness of it. As a girl wife, she hated it, but now she'd feel strange away from it. She is glad when her husband returns, but she does not gush or make a fuss about it. She gets him something good to eat and tidies up the children. She seems contented with her lot, she loves her children, but has no time to show it. She seems harsh to them. Her surroundings are not favourable to the development of the womanly or sentimental side of nature. It must be near daylight now. The room is very close and hot because of the fire. Alligator still watches the wall from time to time. Suddenly, he becomes greatly interested. He draws himself a few inches nearer the petition and a thrill runs through his body. The hair on the back of his neck begins to bristle and the battle-like glow in his yellow eyes. She knows what this means and lays her hand on the stick. The lower end of one of the petition slabs has a large crack on both sides. An evil pair of small bright eyes, bead-like, glisten at one of these holes. The snake, a black one, comes slowly out, about a foot, and moves its head up and down. The dog lies still, and the woman sits as one fascinated. The snake comes out a foot further. She lifts her stick, and the reptile, as though suddenly aware of danger, sticks his head in through the crack on the other side of the slab and hurries to get his tail round after him. Alligator springs and his jaws come together with a snap. He misses, for his nose is large and the snake's body close down in the angle formed by the slabs in the floor. He snaps again as the tail comes round. He has the snake now and tugs it out 18 inches. Thud, thud comes down the woman's club on the ground. Alligator pulls again. Thud, thud, alligator pulls some more. He has the snake out now. It's a black brute five feet long. The head rises to dart about, but the dog has the enemy close to the neck. He's a big, heavy dog, but as quick as a terrier. 
He shakes the snake as though he felt the original curse in common with mankind. The eldest boy wakes up, seizes his stick and tries to get out of bed, but his mother forces him back with a grip of iron. Thud, thud. The snake's back is broken in several places. Thud, thud. Its head is crushed, an alligator's nose skinned again. She lifts the mangled reptile on the point of her stick, carries it to the fire and throws it in, then piles on the wood and watches the snake burn. The boy and the dog watch too. She lays her hand on the dog's head, and all the fierce angry light dies out of its yellow eyes. The younger children are quietened and presently go to sleep. The dirty-legged boy stands for a moment in his shirt, watching the fire. Presently, he looks up at her, sees the tears in her eyes, and throwing his arms round her neck, exclaims, Mother, I won't ever go droving. Blast me if I do. And she hugs him to her worn-out breast and kisses him. And they sit together while the sickly daylight breaks over the bush. God douche. Well, that's a bit of an Aussie tale from 1800s. Seven, 1800s. Very cool. Let's go with the song to finish this up, eh? Country spot on the radio. A sheepskin coat was sewn by hand, but had stayed on all night. They'd ridden their horses through the driving rain from the camp they'd made on the Billaroo Lane. Stock was yarded, the dogs were chained. It was time to hit the town. She was a drover's wife. Lived in a caravan She could match the work Of any man And in the morning They'd be gone They were always moving on The night wore she told us tales of a woman's life on the stock route trails Open fires, a thousand stars and a life of making do Eyes were wide on every child The local women winked and smiled The fellas couldn't quite work out This unexpected guest she was a drover's wife, lived in a caravan. She could match the work of any man. And in the morning, they'd be gone. She was old. God douche. 
So the drover's wife, God bless them, the drover's wives were, drover's wives, they were hard women, they knew what to do. God bless them. Anyway, it's 20 minutes, the drive is strong, wishing you all a peaceful, beautiful day, and don't forget, if you can't be good, be good at it, and don't get caught. God douche. The drive is strong. God douche. Big love, guys.